I wanted to talk about today is uh, um, uh, why, so you, you meant, Craig mentioned how they understand that uh, anomaly detection is a central piece of technology that uh, a lot of companies that collect data and, and w monitor their business continuously, uh, it's really critical. And this is something that's growing in the market. So I'm going to talk about one segment of the market, which is uh, mobile apps. So we've got a lot of companies creating mobile apps, either one or a host of mobile apps, depending on the type of company. And, and I'm going to try to explain why every one of those really needs uh, anomaly detection as they become bigger and larger in scale. So let's say you're a company, Huli, uh, and you, uh, you have a bunch of uh, uh, art studios creating the various games for you. And, and you, you created all these games like, uh, you know, the, the Huli Clash, Huli Run, Huli whatever. Uh, and you put, put them out in the market and you want users to use them. So you're not doing it for fun, you're trying to make money. And how do you make money out of mobile apps today, especially these type of gaming apps? You, you use advertising, in-app in advertising is very strong today. In-app purchases, all these stores, you buy some gold, you buy some all sorts of stuff. My kids waste a lot of my money on that. Uh, referrals, actually referring users to other games is something that, uh, uh, that also generates revenue. Cross promotions of either uh, different apps or different games, all, the, all these are revenue generating streams that actually let you create more apps, create more games and, and stay in business. And you've got some really large players in this space. Now, this is true for mobile gaming, but it's not just mobile gaming. A lot of app development companies uh, have the same uh, revenue generating models. So we all know from ourselves, if we install an app and we start using it, especially games, not mission critical apps that we need, all the time, and it crashes. Actually, the statistics are, is that 16% of users will, will try an app more than twice after it crashes. So it means 84%, you lose 84% after two crashes. Uh, and this is crashes, but there are many things that can go, uh, can go wrong. And now the question is, if something happens that affects your users, affects your installs, affects your, your revenue, how do you know what happened? And how do you know to fix it? If you don't fix it really quickly, then it's going to, you're going to lose people really, really, really fast, right? especially in the mobile market. So this is a true statement always. You can't control what you can't measure. If you're not measuring it, you don't know, how to, you don't know what broke, and you don't know how to fix it. So the first order of business is to measure. But what do you measure? So we're in the big data conference, right? And, and uh, basically, as you become bigger, you measure everything. You want to measure a lot of things. And, you wanna, and what do you have today to, to find out what broke? So you're measuring it. You have dashboarding. You have all sorts of visualization tools, all sorts of BI tools where you are required to ask the question of these tools. And hopefully, you'll, find, uh, you, you'll figure out something is broke uh, with your own eyes. But as you become bigger and you measure more and more and more things, uh, this, this approach doesn't scale. You're not going to be able to use dashboarding to really detect everything that, that is, is going wrong with your app. And why is that? So what are you really measuring? So at high level, you're measuring three things. Revenue, business generation types KPIs, like daily active users, monthly active users, retention rates. Uh, for your app. So these create revenue, right? Because if you have a lot of daily active users, you're going to get more revenue from ads, for example. Uh, if your retention rates is higher, then people are playing with a the game, they're more likely to purchase more things in the game themselves. And one level below that are application level uh, uh, KPIs like crashes and performance and errors and usability. Now, these are few KPIs, but when you break them down to their dimensions, so for example, I'm measuring revenue. I'm just, I'm not, I don't care just at the high level revenue of a game. That won't tell me a lot. I mean, it will show up as, as on my graphs as something bad only if it's really, really big. I want to measure it per app. I want to measure it per ad campaign that I'm running, per partner or affiliate that I'm working with, per store item that I sell in that uh, app store, uh, cross promotions. 
if I'm looking at users, I want to segment them to their geography, to their user segment in terms of ages and so on, to the game that they're playing with, to the other games that they play with. Um, if I'm looking at application performance, it could be, you know, I need to measure it per device type, tablets, mobile, uh, mobile phones, phablets, you know, all sorts of device types, operating systems, network types that they're using, whether it's Wi-Fi or, or 4G or 3G, because things that affect performance, I mean, you can affect performance and you can have all sorts of issues with all these dimensions. So at the end of the day, you end up getting a lot of KPIs, thousands. If you're a small shop, this is in the thousands. And maybe you can handle it with dashboarding. If you're a larger shop or a larger company, it becomes hundreds of thousands to millions. And if you're really, really big, then it could be even billions, just to give you a, a, a notion of how big it can get. Uh, the, one, the biggest one I know in terms of collecting KPIs uh, is Facebook, and last time they published how many KPIs they collect every minute, it's, it's 10 billion. 10 billion, and this is without uh, Instagram. So Instagram is probably about, well, maybe 20% of that. So, so if you're Facebook, yeah, you, there's nothing. I mean, you have huge amounts of data, but even if you're smaller, you have a lot of, uh, a lot of KPIs that you need to observe if you want to really catch what's going on and, and react to it quickly. Besides having a lot of KPIs, these KPIs are also related to each other in various ways, right? My revenue from ad campaigns depends on the daily active users that I have and depends on my application performance and depends on the number of calls I make to ad exchanges. So all these KPIs are related to each other. So it's not enough to just look at them uh, by themselves. You have to look at them together if you want to figure out uh, that there is something going on and to understand what is, how it's impacting and why it's impacting my application and my users, my revenue or my retention rates. So, so they have relationships and it's not enough just to kind of visualize them separately. You need, to under, you, need to, you need something that brings them all together and understands them. So there are a lot of things that can, that can break down slow or there are opportunities that can happen that if you don't track your data, you don't, what you're measuring already, you're going to miss. So I mean, if a partner changes uh, their, their integration API or their data format, it could break things that you thought were working. Uh, if a device uh, changes OS, uh, there is an OS update or new types of devices, your application might not work well there. Uh, if you have external changes, like competitors are bidding on ads, uh, they change their strategy, you might be losing ad revenue. If you have media coverage, that could increase your, your revenue uh, and your downloads. If you have social media exposure, whether positive or negative, that could impact uh, uh, what, the, what you see in your app. And you want to be aware of that. You know, you could have company changes like new versions, new game releases, new campaign types, A-B tests, a lot of things that can cause all sorts of breakdowns and opportunities, and you need to be aware of them and track them as in real time or as in real time as possible in, in all of that data. So what's the solution? Well, not surprising, you need anomaly detection, because what is anomaly detection? It's basically an area of machine learning that takes in input data and highlights what looks to be abnormal in it. Now, in all the cases that I mentioned, you can't really figure out beforehand what are all the possible things that can go wrong and how they will look like in my KPIs. Anomaly detection is unsupervised in a sense that it learns normal patterns, but it will highlight what seems to be abnormal, and then you can react to it uh, because you can't, you can't really map all these cases out beforehand and, and have rules that will figure them out automatically. That's not feasible especially in business-related uh, related data that keeps changing all the time. So what does it take to build an anomaly detection system? And I'm going to describe the, the five steps that we use in, at Anodot uh, to build our system. And, and I strongly believe these are the things that are really necessary if you want to have a reliable and good system that detects anomalies uh, at high scale, high volume of data, and in real time. The first step is to have uh, something that collects all these KPIs, all these metrics. And it has to be universal and it has to scale to millions because you want it to grow as, as you grow. 
And that's not just about having an infrastructure that's fast. That's also about having algorithms that can work on the data stream itself. Because once you collect data and store it somewhere, actually trying to apply machine learning algorithms on 100% of that data, because anomalies can happen anywhere in the data, you can't a priori know where it's going to happen, it won't scale. So you have to have algorithms that work on the stream of the data itself and detect anomalies there, and that's how you scale out to millions, and that's how you become real time. So that's one, one consideration. Then once you are, have algorithms in place on the stream, the first step is to learn what is normal. So you have to have algorithms that learn normal behavior for various types of, uh, of signals. And there could be many, many different types of signals that you have to take into account. The third step is to actually, so detecting anomalies is nice, but then there are all sorts of anomalies. They happen all the time. And you want to be able to uh, uh, prioritize and distinguish between them. So another layer of learning uh, that you will need to add is, uh, is a mechanism that learns the patterns of anomalies and highlights the ones that are more significant, look, look stranger than others. And then that's the only way you can filter out things that are irrelevant to you versus anomalies that are relevant to you. Um, so that's, and to do that, you really have to look at all the patterns of abnormal behaviors and learn them and be able to rank and score them. And I'll, just, I'll, just, I'll show you some examples uh, soon. The fourth step is uh, what we call behavioral topology learning. So I mentioned all these KPIs are related to each other. If I'm going to detect anomalies on each one individually and then flood you with, you know, something happened in, in, in I don't know, in California, and all of a sudden uh, uh, my ad revenue goes down, it's going to affect so many KPIs. And if I flood you with all these anomalies, you're not going to understand anything. You're going to, not going to see the forest for the trees. You're going to see a lot of things go wrong, but it's going to be very hard to actually investigate it. So you're going to waste a lot of time trying to investigate it. So if I am able, if you are able to build a system that uh, groups all these anomalies together and understands their relationship and shows you a, a concise picture of what's going on, then your investigation of what's happening is going to be very fast. You're not going to be flooded with alerts on all sorts of things that go wrong, which usually causes alert fatigue and nobody then notices them anymore and misses and, and it potentially could miss a lot of uh, serious uh, problems. So that's this fourth step. The last, the fifth step is really to, uh, so all these steps are unsupervised. Now, unsupervised learning is, is, is good, but you know, if you can get some feedback from users, it's even better. So having mechanisms that can take in limited amount of feedback and use it with semi-supervised algorithm would really increase the performance of, of, of your anomaly detection and reduce the amount of false positive you get and make sure that you get uh, all your true positives in place so you won't have any false negatives. And really that's, uh, you know, the assumption I don't think anybody can assume that they're going to get a lot of these feedbacks, a lot of these labeled data. Uh, so that's why there are semi-supervised learning techniques that can help you deal with small amount of labeled data and large amount of unlabeled, which is most of, most of the data that you have. So getting that feedback is, is an important step. So let me talk about the challenges in some of these, uh, some of these steps. Um, so this is a, kind of a, has a lot of information. What, what is the challenge in learning the normal behavior for any time series? And again, when you collect a lot of data from a lot of different sources, you would have all sorts of behaviors in the data. So your signal types or your, <clears throat> the way they look over time uh, would be very different. So you could have stationary or non-stationary signals. Stationary means that you know, they are relatively smooth. Non-stationary, they, they, their distribution changes over time. You can't say anything. The distribution, underlying distribution is not static. Uh, you could have uh, signals that get measured regularly or irregularly, and that happens a lot. Sometimes you get you know, measurements every hour or every five minutes, and sometimes you get very sporadic measurements, and it's OK. It happens. Uh, it's not, it's not that it's missing samples, it's just not sampled regularly. And the algorithms that work for regularly sampled signals do not work for irregularly sampled signals. You have signals that are discrete, you have signals that are real valued. That's just in the signal type. Now, once you understand the signal types, 
you, ha you have to understand what type of signal distributions to, can I apply on them to learn what is normal. And again, doing it wrong will mean that you're going to get either a lot of false positives or, uh, or, false neg or true negatives. So, so you're going to miss a lot of issues. So here you have signal di si single mode distributions or mixture distributions, symmetric or non-symmetric distributions, continuous and discrete, and there is a list of them. And if you want to build your own system, you're going to have to uh, take into account that, that you need to identify automatically all these distributions and fit the right one to each one of the uh, KPIs that you're measuring. Seasonal patterns, taking them into account is really critical. If you don't, but if you have a weekly seasonal pattern in your data and you don't take it into account, you're going to get garbage out. Uh, sometimes there are uh, uh, multiple seasonal patterns apparent in every KPI, daily, weekly, hourly, and five hours, all sorts of things happen. Again, you need, if you want a scalable system, that runs automatically on the data, that does not involve human intervention or people tweaking models for every one of the KPIs, which is not scalable, you have to have some, something that identifies this automatically. Last one is ad adaptation. So things change all the time. Uh, if you're a mobile app developer, I mean, you, you know that uh, a game becomes popular, then doesn't, then not popular, then more popular. I mean, and you have to adapt to these changes. I think yesterday there was a talk by the CTO of uh, Nialtec, uh, Pokemon Go. So in the summer they had, you know, huge surge in usage and now it's probably flattened out. I haven't seen their numbers, but I'm sure it's not as it was when they started. So you have to adapt, you know, normal changes. So you have to have algorithms that adapt to it and you have to take care that you're doing it optimally with uh, so adaptation that is optimal during normal times. You have to think about how do I adapt my algorithm when there are anomalies present, and that's not trivial. Do I reject the anomalies and not take them into account? Do I use them but, uh, but not as strongly? There are all sorts of strategies here. Um, and what do I do after I see an anomaly? So how do I adapt after an anomaly occurred? So this is all just a consideration for learning normal. Now, how do you learn abnormal? So uh, here, my bias is in uh, Bayesian statistics, so we use Bayesian models for, for learning what is abnormal. In high level, we compute a model of the anomaly significance given the patterns of the anomalies. So if you look at the two KPIs here and the numbers above them, so you see there are various anomalies here. The one uh, painted in orange in the top, or the bottom one painted in orange, those gets you know, a score of 84, which is a, a significance probability of 0 0.84. Um, and, you can s and the other smaller anomalies get a much lower probability of being significant. They're still anomalies from a mathematical point of view, but they look, they look less significant because you know, even to us as humans, it makes sense. Uh, and that's because you know, they're either small deviations from normal compared to past anomalies. Their pattern is short compared to other anomalies that you see. So if the middle ones are longer anomalies and the other ones are shorter, obviously the longer one would be more significant. It's lasting for a longer time. If it's just a transient anomaly that you see there, then it's not as, uh, uh, it's not as significant as others. So having these scoring mechanisms lets you really rank your anomalies and filter out what's more important and what it's, what's less important. So that's one aspect of learning the abnormal behavior, ranking and scoring. The second asking, aspect of learning the abnormal behavior is really classifying anomalies to different types of anomalies. What do I mean by that? And again, this depends on the pattern. So the anomaly there, uh, you see the, the, the part of the line going out of the normal range. That's a transient anomaly. Right? So that's, that's something that, that lasted for a short time and then things went back to normal. If you have, uh, you have other anomalies where there is a level change. So I have a KPI and all of a sudden there is a level change. Pokemon Go released a new release, boom, m a lot more users. It's an anomaly. It's a good anomaly. Uh, it might be something that you care about or not care about to know, but still, mathematically, it's an anomaly. But then if it changes for a long time, you want your algorithm to adapt to it. So, and then the anomaly is a level change type anomaly. So things have changed and they've stayed differently now for enough time for us to classify it as a level change. Next one, 
trend change, right? Something trends like that, all of a sudden it changes the trend. You flag the beginning of the change trend as an anomaly, and you say, in the beginning you don't know what it is, you say, here's an anomaly. Obviously, any anomaly in the beginning looks like a transient anomaly, but then as it progresses, you can say, oh, there was a trend change, here you go. Something changed in this KPI, it's a trend change. Now you can decide whether it's an opportunity or, something, or some issue that you need to bring it down from that change. Another interesting one uh, that we see quite a lot is uh, 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 seasonal pattern changes. KPIs that have you know, a seasonal pattern. This is an example of dual season having, I believe it was a daily and every, uh, every five hours. So every five hours there was a spike and then there was a daily pattern as well. And then it changed, right? It changed to something that doesn't have a seasonal pattern anymore. And, and you can classify that anomaly in the beginning as something saying there was a season change, now there is no season, or the season periodicity changed to, from, from daily to 12 hours. So again, classifying that way helps you understand what, ha what to do with this anomaly, and sometimes you would act on it, and sometimes you would do something else with it. But uh, it's really important to know. So the last part was uh, behavioral topology learning. I won't touch on the feedback-based learning, uh, but the behavioral topology learning, and this is uh, uh, what we do, at least at Anodot, uh, to learn automatically the relationships between the different KPIs. We look at various aspects of the uh, uh, metrics behavior. Uh, how do they behave during abnormal time? Do they tend to have, uh, do they tend to be anomalous at overlapping periods in the history? And here we use a clustering algorithm called LDA. Uh, we look at whether they tend to correlate during normal times. And here we use stacked autoencoders uh, uh, to, do this, uh, to do this normal behavior similarity. Um, we also look at their properties, right? The, the, every KPI is measuring something with a lot of dimensions. And we do turn-based similarity. And now the b main issues with all of these is scalability. How do you scale it to millions and billions of, uh, of time series? And we use LSH across the board with all these algorithms to make them scale out really, really high. And the output of that is a relationship graph telling us who, which KPIs are related to each other, basically soft clustering them into, into groups. So what's the value of all these uh, different steps? This is an example from our platform. Uh, I took weekly stats for a subset of the metrics that we get, four million metrics. So four, mi four million different time series measuring all sorts of things. Uh, if you just apply the regular anomaly detection, after you took care of all the signal types and distributions and, and you know, made sure you taking into account seasonal patterns and identifying them and so making it as accurate as possible, you still get 158,000 anomalies any type of anomaly found on these four million metrics in one week. That's, that's a big number. So it will be too much. Now, once you learn the abnormal behavior and you're able to rank it and give you only the highest significance ones, uh, it drops to 910 anomalies for that week at least. And then if you group them into using the, what you learn from the behavioral topology uh, learning, then you end up with 140 in seven incidents. That was for, I think it was two weeks ago. So 147 incidents for 4 million metrics. If you're measuring 4 million metrics, you're probably a relatively large organization. You're going to have a lot of people handling these incidents, looking at them. It won't be just one person or one knock. A lot of companies actually don't have a centralized knock anymore, and, and they spread out the responsibility to their BI team, to their dev team, and various other teams. And then this number becomes, you know, actually quite small. And that is a, m a number you can manage and, and still find out the important things that happen that you would miss otherwise. So how do we see people working with an anomaly detection system? Really, once you send data into the system, you want to get the results, right? You want to get notified that there are anomalies, so you get an alert. Usually, the most the typical way people want to consume the anomalies is by getting alerted when something happens. They don't want to sit in front of a monitor all day long and look for anomalies that pop up, but rather they want to be wanted to come to their you know, phones usually. Uh, 
Once you get that, you start investigating it, and you need a system that lets you investigate it really quickly. You apply a remediation, and then you expect to have uh, a close event saying everything went back to normal. Uh, so that's the typical flow that we see. And what I wanted to show is how, uh, show you a, a short demo of how it looks like, at least in our system. And obviously, uh, if you build your own, it could look slightly different. But uh, this is based on a lot of uh, a lot of experience from a lot of customers. So this is an alert email. Uh, so you're a mobile mobile shop. You have all your applications. You're measuring revenue, ad clicks, and so on. Now you get an alert to your email, uh, show, telling you there's a drop in ad clicks, and then you start looking, and you see there are a lot of KPIs related to ad clicks from various uh, OSs, device types, countries, applications that have dropped. So what you see here is you know the whole history, and then here there's a zoom in on that drop basically going out of the normal range. No static threshold would catch it because it's not dropping to zero. It's not you know, increasing here above kind of the normal range of the whole band. But compared to the seasonal patterns that there is in the data, it is, it is a significant drop. And I also see there's a drop in ad revenue. Now, the point here is you get one, if you do the, beha the topology behavioral learning, I can, you can, I can send you one concise alert showing you all of these things drop. You, it's not sending you now 30 different alerts showing you a lot of things that uh, drop and then you, you start losing yourself. Another thing that I think is, is critical that we do as well, I didn't discuss it, is correlate, uh, correlate events with anomalies. So events are really discrete things that happen over time. It could be a holiday, it could be a deployment, it could be uh, I started a campaign, or uh, uh, there was a news article about us now, right? So these are discrete events, and correlating them with anomalies in, in the KPIs helps often helps really understand what's going on uh, and why an anomaly occurred in the first place. So here we correlated an event so showing that there was a version deployment. So I have my apps. I see drop in ad, ad revenue, drop in ad clicks. I understand there's something going on. It's a lot of metrics. Now I go to investigate it. I want to see whether it correlates with additional things uh, that are not in this alert. Uh, additional things, maybe technical things, maybe things related to my partners or to the ad exchange. So I'll, uh, I'll just save the click on investigate and just jump here. Basically, it takes me into the system and shows me, uh, shows me the things that I already saw. Uh, this is the, the anomaly. Now it's showing it after it's already finished because this is a demo and this anomaly already occurred in the past. Uh, but in principle, you, if you click when you get the alert, you'll see it up to here. And this is the event that I showed before, the version release. Now I can look and see, are there additional uh, KPIs that got correlated? I mean, I can scroll and see all the KPIs, but that would be information overload. Uh, if I already know how to group them, I can highlight what are the KPIs that are present. There are 76 of them. What are the KPIs that are present in this anomaly? And what are the dominant dimensions of where they are being measured that seem to be uh, uh, the most significant in all of these KPIs. So I see I have HTTP errors and I have ad display retries. So yeah, ad clicks dropped, revenue dropped. I see ad display retries, HTTP errors. There's something technical going on that's preventing this. I see my uh, exchange API failure count. You know, if I click here, I would actually it will filter all the metrics, show me the API failure counts increasing across different uh, countries and different apps. Like I see it for three different apps, Huli Clash, Huli Errors, Huli Run, Huli Farm, across different countries. So it's not just one geography that's going wrong. So it's probably not a, a provider, uh, network provider that's gone wrong because it's multiple countries. Uh, so, but I do see that it's related to mobile and iOS as opposed to mobile, uh, it's to, as opposed to Android and potentially other operating systems. So from here, I quickly understand I have something related to my ads. Probably it's failing uh, with the exchanges. There was a lot of failures when I tried to bid on ads uh, and it's related to iOS. Well, I also had that event that I saw in the alert 
showing me that there was a version deployment, and I see that event here, and I can read, okay, what did, what did my team do? Uh, they, they, they implemented a change in bid transaction structure uh, for mobile devices. So, okay, now I understand that we implemented a change related to bids in front of exchanges, and I see that on iOS, there was a drop in revenue and clicks and increase in error. So probably we broke something. So you call the team, you wake them up, they, they really fix it, and then uh, when they do fix it, you get an event showing there was you know, a hot fix, it gets correlated with this. Uh, there was a hot fix for iOS devices because of that change. And if I see my, if I see my, uh, my alert closing, my anomaly, my, my data going back to its normal range, I understand this fixed solved the problem, and I'm happy. My revenue is back to normal state, and, and, uh, and everything's good. And you know, if, just to complete the picture, you know, in our system at least, you would get the next message that you would get after that is an alert close telling you, showing you that uh, you know, this, you know, things, things have gone back to normal. Right, so this is the same anomaly, but I see things going back to normal. So this is a transient, uh, transient change or transient anomaly. Why? Because something really broke. I had to fix it. I had to bring it back to its normal state. All right. So that's that's the end of this uh, quick uh, demo. Let me just finish off with uh, uh, my last slide. We have one minute left. To give you a sense of the architecture that we had to build uh, to, to create this system that works in real time on millions and hundreds of millions of metrics, uh, all the learning that's done in the centerpiece there, uh, the online baseline learning and, and real-time anomaly detection. So as the data flows in, we update the models, they live in memory, and we detect anomalies. And if we didn't do it that way, we wouldn't be able to scale out. Uh, we would be able to provide it only a small limited set of metrics. Only after that it goes into a real-time uh, data store and we use Cassandra uh, for that. And once we detect anomalies, all the anomalies go to an event queue. We use Kafka for that uh, and then get grouped with a component that we built, uh, we call it the grouper uh, for lack of a better name. And it uses what we learned about the relationships between the metrics to group anomalies together so you can get one concise uh, anomaly and alert, and when you do investigation, you get you see it really quickly. We use uh, Elasticsearch to do metadata indexing and search, so all the information about the anomalies gets stored in Elastic, so we can display them in the UI or send you the the, the alert uh, nicely. And uh, we use an offline learning component. So, for example, some of the things you don't have to learn in real time, like the relationship maps between metrics, you can run that offline. Uh, you have to continuously learn it because things change, but you don't have to run it on every data point. And we use Hadoop, Spark, and Hive for that with S3 as our data, data warehouse. So that concludes my talk. Any questions? Yes. Y yes, so the, the, the idea is first to st we look at them separately because things could happen for each one individually without the others, and, after, and then we do the correlation or the grouping after the fact with the relationship mapping. So it's a, it's a good question. In a sense, the grouping is a multivariate anomaly detection, but we don't, we, we don't learn the normal behavior as a multivariate problem. So we learn the normal behavior for each one of the signals individually for several reasons. Uh, functionally, uh, we need to be able to do that as well. It's not just about looking at all of them together and finding the anomalies that affect all of them, but rather sometimes there are really individual anomalies and you have to have anyways the models for those. The multivariate normal behavior learning um, techniques often are hard to explain to the users what happened. So, so, so you can detect anomalies, but if you need to show it to a user that understands what this anomaly is, it's it's, it's a challenge in many of these multivariate cases. If you had an automated system that just took that as input and didn't have to know why, then it, 
then you can use them. The last reason is it's, uh, they're hard to scale. If you're doing multivariate over millions, it will be very hard to scale. Using our approach, it's very scalable because the first piece on the most of the data is done on individual signals, and then we combine them after they're anomalous. Uh, so it's a lot easier to scale it. And, it, and it, from our experience, it fits 95% of the cases that you see in, in data of anomalies that you really care about. Maybe there are 5%, and actually, I don't even know of one example where with, where only multivariate would catch something that you wouldn't catch with this approach. But to be on the safe side, probably there are 5% of those, and those are not as common. Yes? Uh, so two questions. Uh, first of all, uh, what do you do with like, the identified anomalies? Do you, do you receive, you said, I think, do you receive some feedback from those users? Right. Do you use, um, like, is there more sources, you know, or so, like, I could maybe you feed this into the model, but, like, even if they're, like, so first, so first, we use those a lot to do the training of classifying the patterns of anomalies. So if you if, I, if you say something is wrong, a false positive, then it, uh, or even if you say it's true positive, we can do various things in the models. Uh, for example, um, skip that. So for example, the abnormal behavior learning learns how to rank them and score them. So if you if you if you tell if I score something as you know, significance of 0 0.5 and you tell me that was a good anomaly, it should get a higher score next time because it's relevant to you and 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 maybe mathematically the Bayesian model didn't think it was strong, but if you add a prior from the user, it can strengthen the significance. Uh, you can even uh, false positives can even change what type of model you use in your normal behavior learning. If I get a lot of false positives for a certain metric, maybe the model I used for learning what's normal is wrong, and then you can you can run something that checks should we change the model here to fit. Uh, so so the anomalies marked as false positives are not anomalies anymore. Uh, and there are a lot of ways we feedback the loop, feedback the, we loop the feedback back into the existing models. Oh, of course, yeah, 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 yeah of course. Any more questions? Yeah. So, so what do you mean, agent? So all this data, maybe it's tracking. Mm -hmm. I think it's coming from agent. Right. So there's a, like an agent that was sent to your model. Right. So that agent uh, may not be smart enough. So why does he have to be? He just needs to measure uh, what, what type of what type of intelligence do you think um, do you think he, he needs? He's an agent that measures the only thing that this human cannot understand. Mm. So that's that's so for, so first of all, if the data coming in is garbage, yeah, the, nothing works, but like any other machine learning approach, garbage in, garbage out, there's no there's no magic <laughs> the, nothing can save you from that if if it if it was okay and you know, it was producing good results uh uh, and all of a sudden it changes its behavior, it will be an anomaly, and then, and then the, the, the end user who uses our system can look at that data and say, okay, I, something went wrong with the data feed. And we've seen that a lot. People use us for Google Analytics. Sometimes their Google Analytics breaks and starts measuring wrong things. So it's not that you know, they, they had an increase in number of users or a decrease in page views. You all of a sudden see that uh, it was actually the agent of Google Analytics that broke, and, but, the, but still, the anomalies will figure it out. Now, if the data is garbage from the start, and, and it's always been garbage, then yeah, we'll, it's up to the owner of the data to understand that the data is, is crap. We, we can't fix data that, that has been wrong from the start. All right. Oh, okay. If there are any other questions, I mean, you guys are, feel free to take it off. Uh, All right. Thank you very much.